I have got something absolutely fascinating for you guys today. I was contacted by Red Funnel and they said we've got some high speed passenger jet ferries. Perhaps you'd like to come and take a tour of one. And honestly, they are amazing. And I said, yes, please. And here we are. This is Red Jet 7. This is a 40 meter aluminium, 40 knot passenger ferry. It's an incredible piece of kit. The technology in this is brilliant. And we are going to do the absolute full tour. We're going to every area on this one. We're going to the passenger areas, of course, but we're also doing the bridge. We're doing the engine spaces, the jet spaces, the lot. This, I think you will find is fascinating. So we're going to step on this way. This is not the normal passenger route in. This is the engineering route. The normal passenger route is actually through a door on the side there. I'll show you that from the inside. And then we're going to head on round and we're going to do the full tour of this one. So we're going to come right round onto this side. There's various engineering spaces here. We're going to come through all of this. So we're going to do the entire boat. We're going to do this area here, which is the FM200 fire discharge area, the engine space. Actually, no, the uh, the jet space is down there, engine space is up here, all of that we're going to do. But I'm going to show you the inside first of all, because this of course is ultimately what these boats are all about. This is about taking 260 passengers at a cruise speed of 35 knots from Southampton to the Isle of Wight. And if that's 260 passengers plus uh, access for two wheelchairs as well, they've got a bike rack on here. And this is <laughs> obviously where they sit. I'll show you a couple of things at the back first of all. We've got, um, just because it is access all areas, I hope there's nobody in here, <laughs> there we go. We've got the loos at the back here. Some of the engineering spaces are back here as well. So it says crew only, but we have got full access. They've told me to go wherever I like and they've shown me all of this. So this is some of the panels. Basically these are breakers in here, so everything that's controlled by the bridge. If these are on auto, it means they're controlled by the bridge or they're just on permanently on if there's any problems they can get right back to all the breakers in behind there and control everything manually so it's kind of what you'll see on here is a lot of backups on backups let's head on through i think i'll take you to the bridge first of all because that is the most interesting bit she's fully air conditioned that's what these fellows in the ceiling are for bike racks are over here on this side this is the normal route on for passengers so these doors open there's a big ramp that lowers down and then it's just an easy walk on and off We've got luggage space here, being ably demonstrated by Jack the Sack, and then more seating up at the front. If we come around this way, there's access here as well. In fact, they generally don't use this. They generally only use the other side, but it is there if it's required. And this is for cabin attendants so they can serve drinks, that kind of stuff. The idea is that people stay seated and then they have the drinks and things brought to them because when you're doing 35 knots, although of course you can move around, it's best that people stay sat down. Anyway, this is where it starts to get really fascinating because all of this, if you've been on one of these ferries, you'll have seen. What you won't have seen is up here because this is going to take us up to the bridge. Now that door, of course, is normally locked <laughs> with a code, but they've unlocked it for me so that we can get around and show you everything. There's a lot of very interesting things to talk about on this boat, and this is very much amongst them. This is where the boat is controlled from. Now, we'll talk about the engines and the technical bits when we go down to the engine space, but what I will mention is that she has four engines, they're on jets, and the first thing you might notice is not what's here, but what's missing, and that is any kind of steering wheel. So basically what you've got is on here, these are controlling the engines. So basically the two port engines are controlled by this one, the two starboard are controlled by this one, and then the steering, which is directing the jets, is this one. So the captain will sit here or in that one because they're duplicated and they can control the entire boat from there. If we come across here, I mentioned backups. This is what I'm talking about. So all of these a backup controls for these. So each engine, you can see them across here, has uh, backups and you've got the, if I come back to this one indeed, you can see the one here, backup control. So you can control not just the engine speeds, so the RPM up and down, that kind of stuff, but also things like the steering and all that kind of stuff. Everything is backups on backups. You see we've got two VHF radios here. We've got two of everything, two GPSs, two radars. The Ectis system is repeated twice. And this, this is not dissimilar to what you find on some of the most sophisticated super yachts. So this is controlling the entire ship. So from here we can go into 
engine monitoring, for example, you can see here all the different parameters that are monitored. We can go into tanks and see what the fuel systems are like. We can go into power control. At the minute, we're on shore power, but it has twin generators as well. We've got bilges in here, so you can see what pumps are running, that kind of stuff. Fire systems as well, all from here. What hatches are open, so everything can be monitored. Uh, the air conditioning systems, that's here. Lighting, the whole darn shooting match is on there. And there's another one over on that side. We've got, um, if I come around here, in fact, you can see we've got CCTV. There's cameras all around the boat, so everything can be monitored. And you can, of course, then configure this however you wish. And then fire system is here. Um, navigation controls, so all this stuff like the active systems is controlled via these uh, keypads and trackballs. But yeah, that is a pretty comprehensive helm position. And that is the view out of the front. If we come up here, in fact, you'll get a better impression of it. There we go. There's radars on this one, two radars, of course, and they spin twice as fast as normal radars because it is a high speed boat. What else we've got? BHF radios for the crew, for crew communications. There's wing stations on here as well. If I come back here, we've got these on each side. So if you're docking, of course, you can be right on the edge and you can see exactly where you're placing the boat. And it's joystick control. It's not that different to IPS in as much as you push it forward, it takes the boat forward, you push it to the side, it'll take the boat to the side. And those jets are so powerful. There's no bow thruster on this. It's not needed. It'll push the boat sideways against 45 knots of wind, apparently. It's a serious, serious bit of kit. We've got air conditioning in here as well, of course. These seats are height adjustable because, of course, crew come in all different shapes and sizes. And these boats run, they run almost all day. You're looking at about 19 hours of service time. If you include, sort of take them out and bring them back in, it's typically 20 hours a day. And they have three of these. There's usually two in service at any one time. Um, so they get some serious use and serious high speed use as well, as I mentioned earlier, 35 knots at a cruise. Another wing station over on this side, the same sort of deal, and again we've got the joystick control on here, and you can see here, again, this is one of these monitoring systems exactly like we saw just across there. The, uh, we're on jets at the minute, and that means that you can uh, see basically what the jets are doing. There's two jets in each hull, it's a catamaran configuration. So each hull has two engines and two jets. So that is that, that is the bridge. Let's press on a bit further, plenty more to see. That's where we came up. We are going to go out this way now. Again, an area where you do not normally get to as a passenger. And <laughs> it started raining, look at that. Okay, I have to try and keep Keep the GoPro, well, the GoPro can get wet. I just need to try and keep the water off of the, off the lens. Um, air conditioning. These are the air conditioning stacks all around here. We've also got dehumidifiers. So um, basically the air conditioning is putting cool air in and the dehumidifiers are pulling damp, warm air out. And they're all the way around here. So there's air conditioning right through the whole of the cabin areas and, of course, the bridge itself. Another thing we've got up here is life rafts. And I looked at these. There's one here. There's one there. And there's one there, and I thought, well, for a, a boat that's carrying over 250 people, well, three life rafts doesn't sound a lot. Actually, they are. These will carry 150 people each. So, in fact, that's an overcapacity there. Two of those on their own would cater for a completely full ship. And the idea is, of course, again, you're, you're back to your reserves, your backups. You know, if there's a fire on this side, well, then you can drop this one, you've got another one at the back there, and these have hydrostatic releases so that if the boat was underwater, they would set off automatically. They can be set off manually. Again, it's backups on backups on backups. And the other thing about them is they are, because the boat is just going from here to the Isle of Wight and back again, you're not sort of miles offshore at any time, they're just big open life rafts and they're double sided. So, whichever way up the life raft lands, it's, got, it's basically got four air chambers that go around, you've got two, and then the floor, and then two. So whichever way it lands, it'll work. Right, let's head out into the rain. What we've also got dotted around the ship um, is 
these are battery boxes or some of the batteries the batteries are split right throughout the whole ship so there's some here there's some in the bridge there's some up on the front there's some in the engine spaces and the idea is that for example if you had a fire in one area then you're not if it's an area with batteries you're not losing all of the batteries and all the power on the ship and in fact although most of the hotel loads as they call them the non the bits non-essential running the boat the, the cabin bits effectively air conditioning that kind of thing run from generators virtually all of it will run from the batteries as well so if you lost generators you can still power pretty much everything i think the only thing you can't power is the air conditioning those are the two radars you can see up on the top there and you've also got gps antennas lights even things like the nav lights all backed up so each set of nav lights there's a backup set as well let's come on round these are the hydrostatic releases these little chaps down here and yeah those are some serious life rafts those remarkable okay let's press on further so we're going to come back down here now this is back to the aft deck close to where we came on remember i pointed out that uh, fire system well, I'm going to show you that now, since we're now into the engineering areas. So this one here takes us in to the FM200. FM200 is a fire suppressant. They used to use CO2. FM200 is better because if it gets discharged accidentally, it won't kill people who happen to be in that space. And that's generally regarded as quite a good thing. These are um, all manual. So basically there are sensors, there's an alarm that will sound if it sensors a fire. That alerts the bridge, they can check using the camera system or go and have a look or whatever else. If there is a fire, they come to here. They can shut down engines and generators with one pull. So this is the port hull, this is the starboard hull. So if the fire was in the starboard side, you'd pull the shut down. That would uh, shut down the engines and the generators. And then you've got that one there pulls and sets off the FM200, floods the area with FM200, and that is what puts the fire out. And then there's a completely separate backup system that's exactly the same size. So you have got that as well. Battery charging is in here as well. That's these uh, Victron systems back here. It's funny, some of these bits you see and you think, oh yeah, I've seen that on super yachts, but of course, this is a little bit more utilitarian than a super yacht. This is designed very much to be fit for purpose, and that is transporting people and doing it in a reliable fashion. OK, let's close that one back up. I'm going to show you the, uh, the jet end area now. I think if we come on back here, the whole boat is aluminium, and you'll see the construction for that when we go down into these areas. She was actually built by the White Shipyard and this particular boat, the White Shipyard is over in the Isle of Wight, hence the name. And this particular boat was built, I think I'm right in saying, in 2018. So this is the newest of the fleet. Hang on, there we go. Right. This then is right down into the bowels. And what we're looking at here is the jets. Now these are the fire suppression uh, systems. I was telling you there's two of them, one's a backup. Um, and there they are. And now you're starting to see the aluminium construction. So I mentioned it was a catamaran. We are in the starboard hull here. We come right back up here. And basically where we are is the, the jets. So the Hamilton water jets at the back. Basically, there are shafts that run down through here, one from each engine in this hull. We're going to look at the engines in a minute. And they are powering the jets. These jets suck water up power it out of the back. Now there's a couple of interesting things about these. Firstly, very, very low uh, drafts. The boat floats in very shallow water. Although it's 40 metres long and 11 metres wide, this will float in just over a metre of water, which is very, very impressive. I mean, that's basically the same sort of amount of water that I need to float my little 26-foot boat in. That's an 8-metre boat. Um, another interesting thing about these is they don't have gearboxes. Basically, the water gets sucked up, it gets powered straight out of the back of the boat, and uh, using the rules of Newton, <laughs> for every action there's an opposite action, and in this case that is driving the boat forward. If you want to go backwards, there are buckets, basically. They're big metal buckets that lower over the jet stream, powering the jet stream round and forcing it backwards. Now, an interesting corollary of that is the fact that Unlike a conventional gearbox where you have to bring the boat back to tick over and then into neutral and then into reverse and then throttle up because if you just went at high speed from forward to ahead you'd smash the gearboxes to pieces. There are no gearboxes. In an emergency, 
when this boat's running at 35 knots, they can drop those buckets and this ship will stop in its own length, literally about 40 to 50 metres. It'll go from 35 knots of stationary. It's pretty spectacular. You possibly would find it a little bit uncomfortable if you're inside, but in an emergency situation, that's what it can do. And they test it. They do actually, when they, um, these boats have uh, serious overhauls every year, it's part of the coding for commercial use, and they take them out and they give them a damn good thrashing and make sure that everything works, and that's part of the test. This is interesting. I didn't expect to find this. This is a Humphrey control unit for the Humphrey trim tabs. These are tabs that come down vertically like blades, um, and they're set on automatic, and they actually, this boat does plane, which gets about 18, 20 knots, it gets up onto the plane, and they help to both level the boat side to side and also fore and aft, make quite a difference to the fuel efficiency and the running of the boat, apparently. Didn't expect to find those. Right, let's back out of here. I'm just going to show you down here, first of all, because I think the construction of these is absolutely fascinating. Oh, there was one more thing I wanted to show you. I'm glad I remembered that before we came out. That is the fact. I mentioned the backups. Now, the most important backups, of course, is keeping the boat running no matter what. Um, we saw the backups for the control systems in the bridge. So you had the control systems on the seats, and you had the central backups, and then backups for those backups. Well, there are more backups, and they're here. In an absolute worst, worst case where literally everything has gone wrong up on the bridge, they can send somebody down here with a radio, and down here they can control direction of the jets, they can control gear select, so that's basically the position of the buckets, they can control the RPM of the engines, and the ship can be driven effectively from here. So it's obviously just a get your home situation, but it means that if everything was to fail in the, in the, uh, in the bridge, then well, you've still got the ability to control the boat. And in fact, if you look up here, you can see the emergency steering kind of code. So you've got normal bridge controls, they malfunction, you transfer to the alternative bridge controls, they malfunction, you switch to the backups using the selector switch, they fail, and then you switch to the alternative backups, and if they fail, you proceed to the jet room where we are now and select local control, and you can control them from here. And there's even a backup for that. I've never seen quite so many backups. I think when you're on one of these, boats being ferried from Southampton to the Isle of Wight and back again, you don't need to worry about things going wrong. <laughs> You've got it covered. Right, let's go and look at the engines. And it stopped raining and the sun's starting to come out. We're having one of those days where the weather is everything today. We're in Southampton at the minute at the Red Funnel Terminal. We're actually at the maintenance dock at the moment. So this boat is currently not in service but it will be soon. Now, more things to show you. Scramble net, it says here. That's this. Now, this is basically what it says. You can attach this to the side, drop that down, and it allows people to scramble up the side. So if you needed to pick somebody up, you could do. But it's more than that. It's a, a crew saver. Uh, crew saver PRD, I think it is. And what you can do with this is you can lower it into the water, and you see how it kind of curls around like this. You can manoeuvre a casualty into it, even if they're unconscious, and then you can lift them up and they come up prone. They come up like this. So if they're unconscious, also helps with things like if they've got cold water shock, that kind of stuff. Keeping the body flat is very important. So it's for recovering people. Not something that I don't think they've ever really had to use, but it is there if it's needed. And you winch it up using this winch just up here. This is where we went into the interior earlier. We're going to head on past that and we're going to head down and look at the engines. This is really interesting. Well, the whole boat, I think, is absolutely fascinating, but this is one of the most fascinating areas of it. So we're back in to the depths. Here we go. This is easier if you're not holding a GoPro, but nonetheless, <laughs> it's manageable if you are okay now we're getting into the real meat of this and it's here i mentioned four engines here are two of them now i also mentioned there are two hulls you can see the shape of the hull here it's here to here and then of course there's a flat bit that goes across that's above the water line and then another one of these on the other side and this is what you find inside the hull exactly the same on the other hull on the other side and these are MTU 2000 series engines. 
Now there's a couple of interesting things to tell you about these. The first of course is the top speed, which is about 40 knots, possibly a touch more. But they're V10 engines, and they used to put uh, series 4000 engines in these, two of them, one in each hull. And by switching to four, they actually found that they were more efficient. So basically what you've got here is about 1200 horsepower. So you've got between these two engines nearly two and a half thousand horsepower, so 5000 across the whole boat. The previous engines were about twice the weight of one of these, so the weight was about the same, but they were significantly less powerful. So instead of, two, instead of 5,000 horsepower, I think it was more like 4,000 horsepower. So these are actually more economical, more efficient, and there's another very good reason for putting two engines into each hull. If you have one big engine in each hull and one of those engines goes wrong, well then you're stuck. With these, you can actually operate the ferry and keep it in service on three engines. So if there is a problem with one of the engines, it doesn't stop the boat. And it doesn't, not just from a case of getting home, but from a case of carrying on operations. She's got 2,800 litres of fuel in each hull. So that's 5,600 litres in total. And that, well, they never run it right to empty because, of course, in fact, they never really normally fill it right up either. They run it between about 85% and 50%. And the reason for that is, firstly, to make sure there's always plenty of reserve, of course. But secondly, because they fuel the boat about three times a day and they do it while passengers are being loaded and unloaded. And that's not long, certainly not long enough to take one of these from empty to full. So they're just basically doing like a splash and dash a few times a day when they're coming in, changing the passengers over. It's actually doing about, as I mentioned earlier, about 20 hours a day. It's doing about 10 round trips a day. And they run these engines out to about 16,000 hours and then they swap them. And they basically go off and be reconditioned by MTU and then they'll potentially get sold for you know, super yachts or whatever else as reconditioned engines. And they put new or reconditioned engines into this one. And that's why we've got these huge hatches up above so that these can be craned straight out. I was talking to the chief engineer earlier who was saying that he's looking at about five hours to swap one of these out. And of course you've got to put another one in. Um, so the whole operation, including testing, is about a day. It's just incredible when you think about it. But yeah, that is a serious, serious bit of kit, isn't it? Well lit in here, we've got camera systems in here, of course, you can see that there. Fire systems in here, as we discussed earlier. And you can see this is part of the fire system here, I think I'm right in saying. Yeah, there it is, FM200 nozzle. So that can flood this area with FM200 and, uh, and obviously wipes out any oxygen and stops the fire in its tracks. We've got generator in here as well. That's up there. But the other thing that's quite interesting about this space, I think, is if I come up here, it's not immediately obvious, but if you look down there, you might notice the engines are actually staggered slightly. So this one's over a bit more onto this side, that one's slightly more outboard. And the reason for that, of course, is because the shafts need to run down next to each other. So the two jet units in each hole. So at the back of the hole is a jet unit here and a jet unit here. This is powering that one, that's powering that one. That's why they're slightly staggered. If you put one in front of the other, of course, it wouldn't quite work, would it? We've got more circuit breakers down here as well. The other thing we've got down here is the generator. And that's up here. As I mentioned, there's one of these in each hull. Um, and these are mostly for running a lot of the, what they call the sort of the, the hotel loads. So air conditioning, lighting, all that kind of stuff, passenger comfort, basically. Um, also down here, that is the intakes for uh, water cooling, for the engines and the generator. Um, also fire hoses, there's fire pumps that run from these engines, so possibly the most powerful fire pumps in the world with those running. Um, and again, they take their intakes from here, so if you close off the valves and take the top of that, you can actually get to the baskets there to clear out any debris that gets into them and that kind of stuff. It's all designed to be easy to maintain and kept running. But that is pretty spectacular, isn't it? I think that's fantastic. That, I think, is one of the most interesting areas of this ship, this and the bridge. But there's more to see, so we'll go on up. I think the only thing left, really, is actually the foredeck area, which is another crew area that you wouldn't normally get to. So we'll wander up there. I did say it was access all areas, and that is exactly what it's going to be. These are the hatches here, above each engine. Another one back there that allow you to lift the engine straight out of the boat. Fantastic. And you can see the life rafts again up here. Um, and they can be deployed by the crew 
from down here or from the bridge or hydrostatically. There's a lot of different ways of activating those. So let's go back inside. Let's loop, I think, all the way around. Uh, PA system is here, so announcements, safety announcements, announcing arrival in Southampton, announcing a arrival in cows, whether you want to speak directly through it, all that is operated from there. That we looked at. That's the main way in. I'm going to come down here past the bike racks. This used to carry slightly more passengers than it does now because they had seating here, but they had so much demand for people wanting to take full-size bikes that that, is, uh, that was a response to it, so they can do that now. Let's come right on up through. These are access to the forward sections of the hull, so engineering spaces, that kind of stuff. All access from there. We've got um, displays around the place as well, <laughs> telling you what drinks are available and other information they want to put up there. And then this, again, this is uh, just a crew area. This is up onto the foredeck. Now this is used basically for berthing the boat, as you can see the big bollards on the side here and not an awful lot else. There is an anchoring uh, system up here. So we've got the capstan here. This is hydraulically controlled um, and the anchor itself is, is out on the front. But of course, bearing in mind how this boat is used, that is really only there for an emergency because you don't normally want to stop <laughs> when you're halfway across on a ferry run. We've got firefighting stuff up here as well. But the other interesting thing about this is that this whole area from this bulkhead forward is a crash structure something that you're never ever likely to need but you have to have because it is a high-speed boat so if you were to run into the side of i don't know a tanker or something didn't notice it not quite sure how you'd manage that but nonetheless if you did it's basically a huge crumple zone as i say that's the one thing that doesn't get tested <laughs> but there it is it's just all part of the coding for the boat um, what else have we got this again is access down to some of the engineering areas I think uh, hydraulic pumps down there, possibly for that anchor winch, I'm not sure. And that, I think, pretty much covers it. A couple of interesting details. All the forward rows of seats have to have seat belts. They don't insist people wear them, but they are there. Again, it's part of the coding. You'll see every seat that doesn't have a seat in front of it has seat belts. And it is, in theory, in case you crash, of course, these you know, are cushioned by this. Um, but uh, Again, it's more of a coding thing than a, than a really needed thing, as it were. I think that's about it. I'm going to go back up to the bridge because I think that is the coolest part of the boat, definitely. And it's the bit we just don't normally get to see, isn't it? There we go. Oh, we have an alarm going off. Hang on. I'm going to kill that. There we go. Alarm acknowledged. And that, I think, is about it. I'm going to sit up here at the helm and I'm going to say absolutely massive thanks to Red Funnel Ferries and to Paul in particular, who is one of the captains who spent a lot of time with me today showing me around this so I can bring it to you guys. And to Lewis, who is the, uh, in charge of all the engineering here, and he showed me around all the engines and answered lots of questions about that. So massive, massive thanks to you guys. Um, and that is Red Jet 7. Very interested to hear what you think about that one. What else should I be touring? We ought to be doing some cruise ships or something, surely. Let me know what you think else we ought to be doing, because I think it'd be great to get on some more of this kind of stuff. Let me know what you think in the comments, and we will catch you on another one of these very soon. Oh, there's one more small thing. We're going um, to take one of these out now and give it a sea trial. Catch you on another one soon. Take care. Bye-bye.